Good afternoon, and thanks for coming. Um, my name is Eugene Xu, and I am a uh, MD-MBA student um, at the Tuck School here and the Dartmouth Medical School. Um, and on behalf of uh, Dean Danos and uh, my fellow club co-chairs of the Healthcare Club here at Tuck and the Dartmouth College Student Assembly, um, who is, is kindly co-sponsoring this event, um, I'd like to welcome you all to Tuck. And thank you for joining us today for the talk with President Kim. Before I introduce Dr. Kim, I'd like to extend a special thank you uh, to the folks that made this event possible. Uh, Laura Hercod in the President's Office, uh, Mike Zubkoff, uh, Liz Roth, Caleb Moore, and Ariel Blumovich uh, of the Healthcare Club, uh, Sally Yeager, uh, Lauren Miller, Becky Rice in the MBA Program Office here at Tuck, um, and uh, Francis Vernon and the, and the Student Assembly for all of their support in marketing the event. Um, and Tuck Facilities, of course, uh, without whom uh, we'd all be talking probably by ourselves to ourselves in the dark. So, um, so, so where do I begin to introduce our accomplished speaker, Dr. Jim Young Kim? Um, just a few of his many accomplishments, and I had to write them down. Um, include showing the world how to treat multidrug resistant tuberculosis in the world's poorest and sickest. Founding Partners in Health, one of the most important organizations in global health today. Leading the HIV AIDS department at the World Health Organization to help developing countries scale up their treatment delivery programs. And inspiring countless students uh, to tackle the world's most challenging problems. And of course, let's not forget his most ac impressive accomplishment to date, being chosen as Dartmouth's 17th <laughs> president. <laughs> Sorry guys, what, one, one last thing. Um, behind all of these accomplishments that I read about, the simple story of a young person struggling to find his passion was what actually resonated with with me and is what I would like to actually leave you with before President Kim comes up. So um, when President Kim came home from his sophomore year at Brown, um, his father picked him up from the, an airport in Iowa and on the way home, he asked him what he wanted to major in. Dr. Kim replied, philosophy and political science. At this point, his father hit the brakes, pulled the car over to the side <laughs> and said to his son, when you finish your residency, you can study whatever you want. <laughs> Sound familiar? Yeah. Um, so, so with that, please join me in welcoming global health leader, innovator, physician, educator, father of two, and Dartmouth's next president, Dr. Jim Young Kim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's such a great thrill to be here. You know, I was um, uh, in the middle of finishing up three jobs at home and getting ready for this um, uh, great experience. And we also now have a, a exactly uh, three, um, three months old today, a, a newborn. I can report to you that uh, I slept well last night, but my wife did not. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's really great to be here. And uh, I wanted to talk to uh, everybody at least once before I got started. And here's what I want to do today. So let me apologize for um, the, the quant folks. I'm not going to show much data today. A little bit, but not much. I work with data all the time, uh, but uh, I'm not going to show very much because I'm going to sort of be in my anthropologist mode today. I want to tell you a couple of stories, and I want to try to derive from those stories um, what, what I've learned, and then talk a little bit at the end about what, what, uh, uh, why that's set me off on this path of uh, trying to lead uh, this extraordinary uh, institution. And the story starts, as always, in Haiti. This is a dam that was built by a company that's now uh, called, um, uh, well, I, actually, I don't know what exactly, but it was at that time called Brown and Root. And it was one of the great American um, uh, 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 companies that built 
dams like this. And so this is a dam on a river in central Haiti. And when they built the dam, the idea was that it would supply power for the entire central uh, valley, that it would uh, provide power even to Port-au-Prince, which was about um, 150 miles uh, in toward the coast. But what the people of that area remember was that all of a sudden, the water started rising. And they flew up, they, they fled up. Is there any way we can adjust the tone of this? No, OK. And they, 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 anyway, they, they, they had to, fl the, to, to really overnight, they remember, pick up their belongings and run up into the hills. And the Haitians had a saying about these hills. They said, you know, Haiti's the only place where um, the hills have teeth. So already, when that dam was built in the 1950s, uh, deforest excuse me, deforestation was occurring. And the reason deforestation was occurring is because people did the last thing that poor people do when they don't have any income. They cut down trees and they make charcoal. So deforestation had already been happening. They went up into these hills. And uh, just to give you a sense for how poor Haiti still is and how poverty has affected the, this, this country, these are mud cookies. Uh, this is a woman who's actually making a business selling mud cookies. These are cookies, cookies made of literally mud, a little bit of oil, a little bit of salt. And she sells them and does a brisk business. Of course, it doesn't have much nutritional value, but the people who eat them and buy them say that it takes the hunger away. This is a photo from last year. Now, this is what it looked like when we came. And again, it's, I'm sorry, it's hard to see. But when we built that building in 1983, it was literally a deforested, rocky, craggy um, uh, backwater. And you can imagine what the poverty was like. Uh, this was a place of unspeakable poverty. You know, still to this day, I haven't been to a place in which the poverty strikes me as um, uh, viscerally as Haiti. Uh, there's, never, there's, not, there's no place in Africa I've ever gone that strikes me as as poor and as um, uh, uh, hopeless in many ways as parts of Haiti. So in the last now 22 years, what we did was uh, we decided that we weren't going to just talk about the need for health care for poor people. We were actually going to do something about it. And we've built a system that actually works. It's a fully functioning health care system in one of the poorest places. Well, it, this is probably the poorest place in the Western Hemisphere. So we have everything from good, um, good supply chain management of drugs. We've actually worked hard and worked with people who are experts in procurement and supply chain managing to get that right. Um, we've, got, we've built inpatient hospital beds. And this inpatient unit is, is, a, is a general medical unit, but we have special units for tuberculosis patients who are infectious. We, we don't want them to infect any other patients. We have an operating room. We have done um, cardiovascular procedures up to and including uh, open heart valve replacements in, uh, in central Haiti. And above, you can see, it's a bustling clinic <clears throat> where people come and line up, uh, sometimes walking uh, for days at a time, because they know that they're going to get high quality care. And if they can't pay, it'll be free. Now, why would we do something like this? Just to be smart, Alex, some people have said that, that these guys are just trying to make a point and bring, quote unquote, first world medicine to third world people. And you know what? That's just not very realistic or cost effective. And so we have been fighting this battle. Why should you do this? Why should you build these kinds of centers in the poorest places? Well, for some of the people in our group, it was a matter of faith. And there are people of faith who, who work with us who say, this is the right way to treat the poor. But for us, it was different. We felt that, for some reason, uh, aspirations in the field of global health were incredibly low. Um, the stories go back even to Albert Schweitzer. One of the um, uh, legendary professors at Harvard, Paul Dudley White, in the 1940s or 50s, I can't remember the exact date, went and visited Albert Schweitzer. And when he came back, he did not write <clears throat> about the wonderful commitment of Albert Schweitzer. He wrote an angry letter um, to his friends and others saying that the hospital <clears throat> that Schweitzer had built in Africa was an embarrassment and an abomination because he didn't use sterile technique, which of course by then they discovered, was doing open surgical procedures without using sterile technique, was not having people wash their hands. Um, he, in fact, had done a lot of diagnoses and found that there were a lot of problems that just weren't being cared for. 
And at the risk, I, you know, I, Albert Schweitzer is a great hero of mine, but the idea back then was not that your goal and that your responsibility was to actually bring high quality medical care. It was about his communion with God in service of the poor. So we knew these lessons and we thought, look, you know, people can do this for all different kinds of reasons, but we want to take the, 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 the task of providing health care for poor people and turn it into not, into not only a sort of social service, but be serious about it. Figure out what it takes to build these kinds of systems. Think hard about what everyone on the face of the planet deserves. Can we really say that um, vaccines are really important for children in, develop, in developed countries, but you know we just can't do it for poor countries? We do that at great risk, especially with things like swine flu and, and, uh, and, and SARS. What we know from those epidemics is that epidemics become global very, very quickly. So uh, our beginning was, one, we're medical doctors. Two, we were both, uh, Paul Farmer and I were both anthropologists. And for us, understanding from an anthropological perspective what it takes to build these kinds of systems was central to our intellectual project. But the third part was we wanted to execute. We wanted to do it really right. We wanted to figure out how to actually do it. In other words, it wasn't enough for us to just stand up and declare that we were on the side of the poor, declare that we love the poor, as, some would, as Paul Dudley White argued that Albert Schweitzer did. We actually felt that it was our um, moral responsibility, but also our professional responsibility as doctors, to actually execute around the values that we espoused. So, one of the things we used, of course, was community health workers, um, illiterate often. We uh, have been building up the skills of our community health workers so that they do what nurses do in most other healthcare settings. It's a form of employment, and we found that they actually follow algorithms far more effectively than physicians and sometimes even nurses and do a great job. And they've extended our capacity to deliver care uh, very, very broadly. And we replanted. So this is, the, this is the area that you saw before. And something happened about 15 years ago. We kept planting trees. Everyone told us we're crazy. Don't forget about planting trees. Just sort of provide basic um, uh, nutritional support. Don't try to do anything too fancy. But we kept planting. And then it reverted. This whole area reverted back to the lush, tropical, uh, uh, rainforest type situation that it must have been like uh, more than 100 years ago. So we figured, we, we learned that not only is it possible to provide high quality health care, it's actually possible to turn around some of the environmental disaster that, um, that, that all the rest of the area was experiencing. If you look up into the hills, you can see that the mountains very close by are still completely deforested. <clears throat> this is a map of the world by land area. This is a great website, world mapper. Map of the world by land area. Um, this is the map of the world by population. This is AIDS. Now, there's a really, really important part of this map that you should all pay attention to. If you look at North America and Europe, you still have some cases up there. And what we've learned is that if you have two million people with a chronic medical condition uh, for which they have to take a medicine every day, that's more than enough to sustain a robust market-based approach to providing medicines uh, for that particular disease. So we now have medicines. We've got maybe, I, I, you know, somebody's going to know better than I, but at a time, from a time in the 19, early 1990s even, when HIV was a universal death sentence, we now probably have close to 30 different medicines and they keep coming out because there's a group of people who continue to live in first world countries who can afford to pay 15, sometimes 20,000 a year, and that's enough of a market to have new drugs. So the task for us was not to generate new drugs or to get people interested in making new drugs like it is for us in tuberculosis because those North America, South America, Europe disappear when it comes to tuberculosis. It's not a matter of getting people interested in finding money for new drugs. It's a matter of just finding ways to get those drugs to the poor people. It's a different task. You look at malaria <clears throat> and all of a sudden all the rich countries disappear. We haven't had a new drug for malaria in a very long time, and the latest new drug uh, is actually a derivative of a Chinese medicine, artemisinin. So we're in trouble with malaria because we're going to get resistant strains of malaria very soon uh, to even artemisinin. And because there's no first world market, 
uh, we're not going to have new drugs. I, 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 don't, I don't think certainly at the number that they have for HIV. <clears throat> so one of the lessons for me is market forces are terribly important. Does anyone know the country in the world who believed in market forces so strongly that they set up their entire healthcare system like that and then it caused them a huge problem during the SARS epidemic? Anyone know? China. The Chinese completely marketized their healthcare system. When I went there as a, as a, as a high-ranking WHO official, they received me like as, as if it were a state visit. And I said, why did you do that? And they said, and this is a communist country, we saw market forces working so well in every other thing, we just thought we'd do it for the healthcare system as well. So every hospital had to make, its own, um, uh, make, make up its own budget. And they got separated. There was no longer a network providing information back and forth. And some people have argued, excuse me, that the rapid marketization of the Chinese healthcare system contributed in part to the slowness of their response to SARS. So market mechanisms are terribly important. They work in some instances extremely well, and we've got to figure out how to harness them for the sake of global health. In malaria, I worry, because there doesn't, the problem doesn't exist in the first world. Now, you know, uh, some people have said, well, but that's because, you know, it's infectious disease problems that are mostly in developing countries. And you look at the, the annual heart attack de deaths, look at India, look at Africa, look at China. It's not as if poor people just suffer from infectious diseases, they also suffer from all these chronic conditions like heart disease, diabetes, and other problems. So we've got major problems. Healthcare for those countries is a major problem. <clears throat> and then if you look at health spending, Africa almost completely disappears except for South Africa. So a very, very low estimate is that at least 10 million people die every year from completely preventable, completely treatable things. Now, if you add into that all the children who die under the age of five, some 15 million, kids shouldn't die under the age of five. Um, you've got a huge, huge problem to tackle. At Partners in Health, this is where we work. We started out um, just in Haiti, and then the second um, developing country we began working in was Roxbury in Boston, and then we spread from there. Because for us, it's always been the same. It's about uh, the problem of delivering health care to the poorest. Well, how do you do that? What, what, can, what can we do to make that a reality? This is um, Caraballo. It's in the northern cone of Lima, Peru. It's uh, where I first went in 1994. And this is, in, among the developing countries we work in, this is actually the wealthiest. Um, you can tell some things about Peru and how fast the economy is growing, because even though the, 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 the houses don't look so great, you see lampposts. So that about 50% of the households had electricity uh, when we arrived there. Now, you know, this is not you know, your, your sense of the suburb that you want to live in, but these uh, straw homes turn into brick over time. And they know that that's going to happen, and so the government puts in this infrastructure knowing that over time uh, these houses are going to evolve. So when we went to Peru in 1994, we discovered patients like this who were in what was at that time the best tuberculosis control program in the developing world. Peru had made stunning achievements in tuberculosis control, and yet we were finding patients like this who'd been treated once, twice, three times, four times in the standard TB control program, but who were still sick, who were still coughing, who still clearly had tuberculosis. Uh, we decided that we needed to find out what was going on. We, we were doctors, we knew, the, we, we, we were pretty sure that, that these people were suffering from drug-resistant tuberculosis, in other words, a form of tuberculosis that had grown resistant to the most important drugs. And the Tuperuvian program, like almost all programs in developing countries at the time, only treated people with the first-line drugs, the cheapest, most, um, uh, most effective, but the cheapest drugs. And you know, frankly, we have probably six or seven drugs now that are really good for tuberculosis. We should have 50, but we've got about six or seven. So what we did was we took the sputums of people like this, uh, packed them in little you know, uh, freezer uh, bags with, um, with uh, 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 ice packs, and carried them with us um, back to, to Boston, because there was no place in Peru at the time that could do the kind of drug sensitivity testing that would tell us what was going on with these bugs. So um, we looked at the Miami, as we were going through the Miami airport, we looked at all the signs. It says, don't bring food or birds or, or um, um, other agricultural products, but nothing about don't bring sputum. <laughs> so, so we brought sputum back, we sent it to the Massachusetts State Laboratory, and we got these results that, we, that, we, that were easily predictable. 
terrible drug resistance. And yet the response we got was really kind of stunning to us. Uh, the head of the National Tuberculosis Program in Peru at the time, who's now become a very close friend, said to us, if you treat a single person for drug-resistant tuberculosis, we will kick you out of the country. Okay? So what was going on here? It wasn't just that they were saying, yeah, you know, we know it's a problem, we know it's a, it's a, it's a big issue, but we preferred if you didn't do anything because it could be bad for us. And they said, no, if you do it, we'll kick you out of the country. And it was coming from WHO headquarters. These were the kinds of things that they were saying. Usually die because it's impossible. There'd never been a major clinical trial where they actually tried to treat drug-resistant TB patients in a poor country, so that was, in a sense, true, and that it's too expensive to treat, and that was also true. The drugs, uh, the cost of the drugs right at that time in 1996 was about $25,000 for a complete course. And so they were saying, you know, the cost of drugs for TB was about $100 back then, so the choice is treating one patient for $25,000 or many more patients for $100. Don't treat these patients with drug resistance. But we kept saying, but think about the epidemiology. Think about the nature of the bug. This is an airborne infectious disease. Oh, yeah, but they, 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 were, they were saying, they were making all kinds of claims to us without really having the data. But, you know, uh, uh, all bacteria make certain metabolic compromises when they become resistant. So we don't think it's as fit a bug. In other words, it doesn't, it doesn't spread as easily, it's not as, it's not as uh, virulent. These are all the things that we were told, but we said, but wait a minute, do you know that? Do you know that it's not as virulent? Do you know that it doesn't spread as much? Do you know that no one else is going to get sick from it? And the answer was that they didn't, but they just didn't feel in 1996 that it was the right political thing to do to talk about drug-resistant tuberculosis. And again, they, they, they accused us of, uh, of trying to bring uh, first world medicine to developing countries. They, they literally, they called us medicos aventurosos, you know, physician adventurers who were trying to make a point but didn't really get it. So, of course, we started treating the patients. Uh, <laughs> and in the first cohort of 45 patients, we got over an 80% cure rate. Now, again, if you want to see the, the clinical data, we've got New England Journal papers uh, that, that describe what happened. Uh, but we got over 80% cure rate, and it blew people away. We had a, we had a meeting in 1998 uh, that we, um, um, in which we showed our results prior to them being published. And I would say the people who, who um, uh, the, more, the more, what should I say, the more forward-thinking people in the TB community were blown away and said, we've got to do something differently now. You've now proven we can no longer say it's impossible to do so we've got to do something about it. But you know, it doesn't matter because the, the, the cost of the drugs is too high. It was still $25,000. So I asked a question. I said, are these drugs generic or not? Are these drugs off patent or not? And the people at WHO who insisted, who absolutely insisted that the drugs were too expensive, therefore it's not doable, when I said to them, are these drugs on patent or not? They said, well, what does that mean? Right? <laughs> Terribly important point. Drugs, once they go off patent, drop about 50% in the first year, and then over time, with economies of scale, drop 90 to 95%. Now, I had done my PhD in anthropology, but I had focused on the drug industry. So I, my, my uh, PhD dissertation was on the drug industry in Korea, so I knew something about this. So we said, so why don't we get uh, generic companies in India and China to start making these drugs? We know how to do that. So we got together with a few other organizations, and within a year, and, and you know, the, 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 the critical point here is that it was incredibly trivial to make this happen, a drop in the price of drugs between 85 and 95 percent. A year it took. So a death sentence was declared because they argued that it was impossible to do, but no one had tried it. A death sentence was declared because they said it was too expensive, but nobody bothered to look. 85, 95 percent. It was still expensive, probably 1,500 to 2,000 dollars at least for treatment, but that's very different from $25,000. And there were enough, of a pro enough problems. The Russian prison system was exploding with drug-resistant TB. Countries like Estonia and Latvia were seeing huge epidemics. And the thing we were worried most about was Southern Africa, where we knew there was a problem of drug-resistant TB, and then when TB and HIV come together, you know, it's almost like kindling exploding. Uh, we knew that because HIV knocks out precisely that part of the immune system that keeps tuberculosis in check,
for people who are in, in, infected with tuberculosis but not sick with tuberculosis, that when those two things come together, we knew there would be um, a huge price to pay, and that's just what we're seeing. We're seeing that right now in Southern Africa. Epidemics of not only uh, multi-drug MDR-TB, which is resistance to two drugs, but XDR-TB, re resistance to at least four drugs. We're seeing HIV epidemics and these epidemics coming together now, and I frankly don't know if we're gonna get our, our, our arms around it. Um, the number of projects exploded. So from here, in 1996, there were zero people on treatment, and we put the first ones on treatment. And now, uh, at least theoretically, because the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria pays for treatment, everyone in the world, at least in theory, can have access to treatment. So, you know, um, let me be really clear. It wasn't just our group that did it, but it, at first it was. There was no other group out there that really was trying to treat the patients, to bring the drug prices down, insisting that this is a human rights issue and an epidemiological issue. And I think the human rights issue was what people first reacted to, but now I think everyone understands that the epidemiological issue, the disease control issue, is so critical that we've, we, are not we are now playing catch up. Um, this is a, one of the most important, uh, I think, graphs that anyone can look at. This is the drop in life expectancy from HIV in Africa. It's just, as an anthropologist, I can tell you, or as, it, you know, as demographers can tell you, you just don't see drops in life expectancy like this um, uh, you know, on a regular basis. Even flu pandemics, they do it in a very different way. This is people between 15 and 50, the most productive age um, of, of the population, uh, all of a sudden dying in huge numbers. Uh, Swaziland, a small country, 1.2 million people, Swaziland has an adult seropositivity rate of 45%. Half the adults, almost, are living with HIV. This is just an absolute disaster. And on the other hand, because there's so many people in the first world suffering from HIV, living with HIV, we've found drugs. And when the so-called highly active antiretroviral therapy uh, um, came on the market, you saw a drop in death rates. So this is a mortality curve, right? So what was before a universal death sentence all of a sudden became a treatable, manageable chronic disease. So what was the response then when we saw this happening? What did we do? Well, at Partners in Health, we started treating people uh, as much as we could but even as recently as 2000, okay, so this is 2000, this is a bunch of the radical left, absolute crazies who are advocates for people living with HIV. And in 2000, they said, I think we're just gonna have to focus on prevention. And we kept saying, but what are you talking about? We've got the drugs. You mean that the some 30 million people living in Africa, what are you telling them? And some very powerful, very famous people literally said, well, Gosh, we feel bad, but I think with HIV, we're talking about the next generation. So once again, uh, even though we had the drugs, a death sentence was declared on, this time, a lot more people, 30 million people. Sound familiar? So what did we do? Um, this, is a more, this is a recent photo, but this is the most famous HIV patient in the world, Joseph Jun. Joseph is a friend of mine, and he came in, his mother, the question she asked Paul Farmer when she brought him in in Haiti was, can I borrow some money for his coffin? I mean, he looks like he was dying. And you've, we, we haven't seen pictures like this in the United States since 1996. We don't let patients get this sick. But Joseph was suffering from TB and HIV. Luckily, his tuberculosis was not drug resistant. So we treated him for both TB and HIV. And six months later, he looked like this. We call this the Lazarus effect of HIV treatment. And it's important not because HIV is any more important than any of the other diseases that poor people suffer from. It's important because this stirs the imagination of politicians, stirs the imagination of donors, stirs the imagination of people who may not understand uh, risks of pandemic flu from an epidemiological point of view, but understand what it means to save somebody's life. And we knew that. As anthropologists, we knew that. We knew that this was not more important than children dying of diarrheal disease. That's just as important, and we need to take that on just as much. But these pictures, we thought, would have a special impact on, on, on the people who make big decisions about money. So 
uh, in 2003, at about that same time, Dr. J.W. Lee, who uh, tragically passed away, became Director General of the World Health Organization, and I ran his campaign. And just, it, was a, it was a totally bizarre election. He was running against the head of a UN agency, the former prime minister of an African country, and the Minister of Health of Mexico. All incredibly well-known candidates, and he won. And we, 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 we did okay, we did, we did well with that particular campaign. We counted the votes and we, we, we got him elected. And he called me and said, I want you to come to WHO. And I said, I hate Geneva, why would I? What? Sorry if any Swiss people are here, I apologize. <laughs> but, you know, Geneva has just about the worst Chinese and Korean food I've ever tasted. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's really expensive. And there are ordinances, there are actual ordinances that say, one, you can't mow your lawn on Sundays and you can't flush the toilet in an apartment building after 10 o'clock. So, you know, when we first moved there, we were in an apartment, we flushed the toilet every night at 10.30 and waited at the door to see if they'd come and arrest us. <laughs> but I, you know, this was not, this was not a, a place that I loved to go to, but he said, come to WHO and help me run, and I said, I will, but you've gotta let us do something about HIV. So right about on the same day that he won the election, President Bush announced the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which I have to tell you, it's just one of the most important things that any government anywhere has ever done. I mean, I, you know, President Bush uh, should be commended for doing that. It was just stunning when he did it. On the same day, J.W. Lee gets elected. So we went and we started the 3x5 initiative. And this was based partly on stuff that, that has been coming out of the Dartmouth Institute for years. Uh, the, the, the work of, uh, of Mike and Jack Wenberg. You know, I've always, I was told by a guy named Don Berwick, who is a, who is a, a student of uh, all the work that's been done here at Dartmouth, that if you don't have a clear goal with a clear end date, you can never get anything done. So the previous director general had said, well, we should probably get three million people on treatment by 2005 if we're very lucky, but then she never did anything about it because she announced the next day, just about, that, or, or soon afterwards, that she wasn't gonna run for reelection. So she made a great target, but didn't really follow up because she was retiring and she didn't want to take on the, the mantle. So we came in, July 2003, we launched this effort. And it only gave us two and a half years to go from about two or 300,000 on treatment to three million. Everyone says it was the, it was the most ambitious, the most insane, the most, um, um, the, uh, the, 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 the most infuriating target the WHO had ever set. But we got things moving. We got things moving. Um, what we did, and the key, again, Don told me this, is you know, you gotta measure. You, and and it, even if your measures are not the best, you gotta really take the time to measure. And as long as your measures are better than anyone else's, it's gonna have a social impact. Let, a, let, let everyone else try to catch up and measure more effectively, but if you're at least measuring something, it's gonna make a difference. So we sent our folks out into the field and said how many are on treatment in Nigeria, in India, and we published it every six months. So every six months the world would come to WHO, I would do a press conference, and we would have literally five or 600 stories about how countries were doing. South Africa, Nigeria, and India, the three highest prevalence countries, were doing poorly. And I got into a verbal um, um, uh, sparring match with the Minister of Health of South Africa. I kept saying, I don't know what's going on. Why aren't they doing better? And they were furious, which is just what we wanted. We wanted them to be under pressure from their own people. If they knew that Zambia was you know, uh, beyond all uh, 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 sense of what they could do getting people on treatment, you know, the people of uh, South Africa were saying, well, if Zambia can do it, why can't we do it? And that's what we, that was our contribution. So um, we put Joseph's story everywhere, all right? These before and after pictures, we put them everywhere. And in August of 2006, we actually went to the um, Toronto HIV AIDS meeting, and some of our team at Partners in Health walked by a poster from a group in Kenya, and they had Joseph's before and after pictures. And they said, hey, that's Joseph. Um, he's our friend from Haiti. I said, no, no, he's, he's Kenyan. <laughs> they, uh, they, they knew his name, they knew his drug regimen, they knew where he lived. And we said, no, that's Joseph. Because no, no, he's, he's, he's Kenyan. So we had actually brought Joseph to the meeting because he'd become a public speaker. So we took Joseph up to the people from the Kenyan pro project and said, no, here he is. And they were shocked, they took pictures with him. Uh, the point is that Joseph became Kenyan. He really did. He became Kenyan, he became Zambian. He became those people because he became the symbol of hope. Now, you know, how do you measure that? You, you can't, it's difficult to.
But having this person, this Haitian person, who everyone thought was African, on these before and after pictures seemed to have some sort of an impact that made people feel that things were possible that they had been told before were impossible. We reached the target end of 2007. It turns out that missing a target by two years is the best WHO has ever done on a target. <laughs> uh, but here's what I did at the end of 2005. Between 2003 and 2005, the people at WHO, you know what they're most concerned about? They're saying, but if we don't make the target, who will take the blame? And I was incredulous. I was saying, so you wouldn't do this because you're afraid that someone is going to have to take the blame? They said, yeah, that's how things work. So I said, OK, you know what? I'll take the blame. I'll take the blame because even if I take the blame, I suspect that I'll still have a job. I'll be able to feed my family. Let me take the blame. And that's actually what I did. In the summer of 2005, when we knew we weren't going to make it, um, BBC did this interview. And they kept beating on me. But Dr. Kim, what are you going to say if we don't make the target? And uh, I said, well, finally I gave in. I said, you know, all we can do is apologize for not working faster, for not having thought of this sooner, uh, for all the people who lost loved ones, all we can do is apologize. And so they've put that interview on hold. And when we came out and said, we're not going to make the target, the BBC put that story everywhere. Kim of WHO apologizes for the three by five target. And that's not actually what I said. But uh, what was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> What was interesting is that all the attacks that people had been planning to go after WHO for missing the target sort of fizzled. You know, they're saying, how can we attack this guy? He attacked himself already, right? <laughs> so interestingly, I just took it off the table. I said, I'll take the blame. It's not, not a problem for me. I'll take the blame. It's my fault. And then things started to change. And they started seeing that we created real momentum. And J.W. Lee, who passed away in 2006, is now remembered. The one thing, the one thing he's remembered for it's the three by five initiative. So it was a really important lesson in leadership for me. You know, knowing how to take the blame for something or just understanding what the stakes are for you personally versus you know, what the project that you're trying to take on was important. Now, to JW's great credit, he said, no, no, no. You don't take the blame. I take the blame. I'm happy to take the blame. Blame me. So it's, it, it's a, it's a, it, it wouldn't have happened if the, if the director general was worried about taking the blame. I think if Dr. Bruntland, who was the previous director general, if she hadn't retired, I'm sure she would have done something like this too. She was a great, great leader of that organization. But it was, uh, it, 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 we inherited it. So there is an implementation bottleneck. You know, let me say it again. Over and over and over again, when I look at people who are committed to achieving a social goal, health, education, social protection, environmental sustainability, it seems so often that as long as we're on the right side, as long as we're on the side of the social goal, as long as we declare our values about that social goal, we're excused for executing very poorly. We don't focus on actually getting the execution done. So, you know, all over Africa, I was seeing programs that started with great enthusiasm, great energy, but the procurement supply chain management systems were terrible, and they stocked out all the time. There was no system for following patients over time. We wanted to get them started on treatment, but had no plan for keeping them on treatment. And you know, I think, again, as the Dartmouth Institute has shown again and again, that happens in the American healthcare system. Does it happen in higher education? We'll find out. <laughs> my, suspicion, my suspicion is that uh, and, and from everything I've seen and heard, that Dartmouth executes around the goal of higher education better than any other institution that I've seen. But this is a general problem. So we call it the implementation bottleneck. You know, we've got all these things in developing countries, but they're not being um, delivered. And so for global health, we've got this is 77 billion before the 50 billion that was pledged again by the US government. Uh, in the new administration. So we've got 150 billion new dollars for global health. Uh, groups like the Gates Foundation are focusing in, in, a, in a very much needed way. We can't, I, you know, the, the Gateses transformed the field, have given us all new hope. But what Bill Gates is interested in is making new tools. You know, he's interested in the science of, of, uh, of global health and also taking the science and building new tools. We need new tools. I told you, we need new tools for malaria. We need new tools for TB. But what's going to happen if the 50 new products that the Gates Foundation wants to get out in the next five years actually get out, and we're still implementing the way we have always been? 
it will go directly against their stated goal. Their stated goal is global health equity. But who's going to get these new products? Travelers and the elites of those countries. So it could actually make global health inequity worse if we just focus on the science and developing new tools. Again, it's the sense that if you get to the molecular level and you develop new tools, and those two processes, we've done better than anyone else, and we've got to keep doing it. But there's just been the sense that once you get to the, to, the, to the molecular level and you got a new tool, you're done. Now, we know that in the United States, um, the time that it takes for a new intervention or pill or something that's already on the market and available, the Institute of Medicine says that the time it takes for, for, for you know, clearly new and better interventions to get to everybody who needs them is 17 years. Should be 17 months or 17 weeks, but it's 17 years. So, I have been working for the last three years on building what we think is a whole new field. We're calling it global health delivery science, but we think, I think it's different. I think it's the science of execution around our most cherished goals, and it's definitely multidisciplinary. Unfortunately, anthropology, I think, fits in very nicely, but I think it's a new group of players who um, really need to tackle this problem of getting complex social groups to accomplish things that they would never do otherwise. In healthcare, I think it's just an absolutely new field. You know, there was a time when we thought that basic science was really not that important to the study of medicine. There was a time when we thought that clinical science was really not that important to the study of medicine. And certainly these major meta studies that are being done all the time, these are, these are new kinds of sciences. And I think this fourth science is critical. And I would love to work with all of you to think about what Dartmouth could do to build this new science. Um, we started off by simply trying to find out what people are doing. You know, when, when, when I went to the business school and to the Sloan School of Management at uh, MIT and to the, to the, to the division of, uh, of uh, systems engineering at MIT, they all asked me the same question. They said, well, so what do you know about what people are actually doing? What are the systems that are in place? And we couldn't find anything that was a comprehensive, qualitative look and what systems were in place. So we started writing them. And over the last two and a half years, we've written about 30 uh, Harvard Business School style cases, which is just the beginning. It's the observational stage of what we hope will become a science. Uh, we started working with people like Michael Porter at Harvard Business School and just, just mapping out what are all the things that you need to do to actually get where you want to get at the end of the day. We started working on trying to develop theoretical models of how global health delivery works. Um, we're just finishing up a project with 14 other universities in which we're trying to ask a very specific question. How can you take money that's coming for disease-specific programs, HIV, TB, malaria, and translate that into the building of systems that can take care of a broader range of problems? Remember the map I showed you about cardiovascular disease? The great thing about HIV treatment is not that it's about HIV, but that it's a chronic disease. You have to find a patient and treat that person for the rest of their lives. That's the real beauty of HIV treatment because that then gives us the opportunity to say, well, you know, on top of that, why don't you treat diabetes? Why don't you treat heart disease? Why don't you treat hypertension? So HIV treatment really gave us the opportunity to think about building systems as opposed to just treating single diseases. You know, the Obama plan, he, this guy's talking about the Marshall Plan. I mean, the Marshall Plan, if, uh, if any of you have studied the Marshall Plan, I was stunned when I studied the Marshall Plan. Um, at its height, it, it um, provided almost 2.5% of GDP for foreign assistance. Does anyone know what we're giving now? 0.01%, right? So to, for him to talk about the Marshall, it would be the equivalent of about $330 billion a year in foreign assistance if we matched the Marshall Plan. So, you know, foreign assistance is a difficult topic. It's, a, it's one that we'll have to all take seriously, and I hope that, that we can talk about this together. But it's an exciting time in many ways to be in this business. So why would I give up all this for this? <laughs> <clears throat> well, in the process of going through the search, I studied you guys a lot, and, and here's what I learned. For one thing, um, uh, it, once I started showing a real interest 
in the nitty gritty of Dartmouth College. People started coming out of the closet as Dartmouth people to me. <laughs> people who I thought were otherwise perfectly normal uh, uh, would come out as Dartmouth alums. And I, it was stunning to me, uh, the emotional content uh, of the way that alums talk about this place. And this is just an absolute tribute to the faculty, absolute tribute to the staff, and all of you who've just been providing these extraordinary experiences. You know, hard-edged um, uh, investment uh, gurus would start talking about Dartmouth and tears would come to their eyes, <laughs> you know. Um, recent grads, you know, Asian Americans who grew up in Chinatown, I met one the other day, and she came up and started talking to me, and same thing, you know, tears come to her, oh, I love that place, it's so wonderful. So I started asking the question, what's going on here? <laughs> I met an 82 um, who is a psychiatrist who does uh, functional MRIs, and he thinks that something actually happens to your brain, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, 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 you know, my, 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 um, my uh, fantasy is that, you know, if, if there's a lot of stress and bad things going on in your brain, it looks red. Let's say crimson, all right? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and if good things go on, it's blues and greens, of course, right? So my fantasy is to get a, a slide that says, here's your brain on Cambridge, uh, <laughs> and here's your brain on Dartmouth. <laughs> He actually, he wants to do studies of functional MRIs <laughs> of people who come from urban settings and come to this place. So what, what do I think is happening here? First of all, I think that being in this setting is really important. As an anthropologist, I can tell you that uh, knowing how to read the natural environment well <clears throat> was critical for our survival, right? The, the, the branches off Neanderthal man that were not good at reading the environment, they are not here with us today. You, so our brains, everyone in brain science, I mean the brain, I'm really looking forward to talking to the brain science because I'm making it up here, folks. This is just bits and pieces. But the brain scientists tell me that our brains co-evolved with the natural world. And people are doing these studies looking at you know, apartment buildings where half of it looks out onto a green space and half of it looks out onto concrete and finding differences in ability to retain information. So I think that beyond just being in a nice place, there's something about being in a natural setting that's very special. Now, you know, I think that the intensity of social interaction here at Dartmouth is also very special. You know, um, groups all over the world try to get 20 to 30 people together to form close friendships, to break down the, the barriers between them, and then maintain those friendships for the rest of their lives. And there's data now that suggests that close friendships are really important for long-term survival. So, and again, I, you know, this is not my area of research, but I have been reading, and it strikes me that this is done very well here with the fraternities and sororities, with the sports teams, and I think, and, and again, I've been reading in the higher education literature, and they suggest that we underestimate the importance of social organizations and sports in the education of young people. So this is, this is really, really done well here, and it's a, a part of the system that I hope we can grow and improve even over time. And finally, it's just the contact with, uh, with tenured professors. You know, um, some of the most hard-bitten, well-known, critical alums, I sat with one uh, a few months ago, and he was a first-generation college student in his family. And this guy is a captain, captain, captain of industry. And when he talked to me about his physics professor, who believed in him, who spent time with him, tears came to his eyes. So there's something really special about the time you have with the tenure faculty, the access that you have to them, that also builds this kind of, uh, of um, uh, wonderful sense. Now, you know, a really important question for me, I have lived my life with a sense of urgency, a sense of urgency around global health problems, around the fact that people are dying with TB and HIV, and it's an ongoing question whether it's okay to have a sense of urgency as a president of a great place like Dartmouth. So one of my heroes, Martin Luther King, I think said the best thing about what it means to have a sense of urgency. This is from um, uh, 
one of his books. This is a, um, uh, something that he wrote while he was in the Birmingham jail. And it's that all Christians, and this was a letter from someone who said that they were on his side. All Christians know that the colored people will receive equal rights eventually, eventually. But it is possible that you are in too great a religious hurry. It has taken Christianity almost 2,000 years to accomplish what it has. The teachings of Christ take time to come to earth, to which Martin Luther King responded. Such an attitude stems from a tragic misconception of time and a strangely irrational notion that there is something in the flow of time that will inevitably cure all ills. Actually, time itself is neutral. It can be used destructively or constructively. More and more I feel that the people of ill will have used time much more effectively than the people of goodwill. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. This was in response to someone who told him that good things take time and we have to wait. So I can't tell you how excited I am to work with all of you with a sense of urgency to take Dartmouth College to even greater heights. I think this is a very special place. You, you know, there are lots of Harvard people who cry, but it's usually while they're at Harvard. Uh, uh, uh. And let me just be honest, I don't see them cry when they talk about the experience that they had. I don't see brown students cry. It's something that's very different. There's an emotional connection. So we start off with a fantastic foundation, but where can we take Dartmouth College? I, I, I'm gonna spend the next uh, year at least um, learning from all of you to figure out what that plan might be. And I just wanna end by congratulating all the seniors. I'm very sorry to not be able to spend more time with you, uh, but um, uh, I t hope that you too will soon start crying when you think about Dartmouth. <laughs> and um, I thank you very much for your attention. I really look forward to hearing, you know, uh, questions, comments, warnings. Uh, all, uh, I really look forward to hearing uh, uh, from, from Actually, Dr. Kim, let me cut you off right there. Yeah. We just want to, on behalf of the Tuck Healthcare Club and the Dartmouth Undergraduate Student Assembly, we'd like to thank you so much thank you. for coming and speaking with you. Caleb, thank you. We have a gift Eugene, for you here. Thank you. Liz, thank you so much. You. Great. We've also, we've left ourselves plenty of time for, for question and answers, so we're going to get to hear questions from, the, from everyone in the audience. A couple of quick ground rules here. We're going to have two microphones circulating up and down the aisles here. Maybe you want to line up on both sides. That Please, would be great. Yeah. for the benefit yeah. of every, all the folks that are in the overflow rooms, there's plenty of people who couldn't attend today who are going to watch, watch this on DVD. We'd like you to wait till you have the microphone in hand and then ask, ask your question. And so, and when you get the microphone, please do us a favor. We'd like to hear where, you are, where you're from, uh, wh what your connection is to Dartmouth, and, and then go ahead and ask President Kim your question. Um, and we've left, we've left plenty of time. We've got 30 minutes, so we're going to get a lot of questions taken care of. So hand up. Dr. Kim will call on you. Uh, real briefly, my name's Caleb Moore, Dartmouth, class of 2001, Tuck 2010. My question for Dr. Kim, what the heck were you thinking teaching at Harvard? <laughs> And beyond that, we'll, uh, we'll go through about as many as we can. Sound good? Great. Yes. My name is Lee Lind. I'm a professor of engineering here. And so I'd like to uh, thank you for your remarks, and especially thank you for taking this job. Thank you. <laughs> so my question is, <clears throat> Your, your title was Tackling the World's Toughest Problems, of which there are many. A whole cluster of them involve health care, and many don't. So it's a two-part question. How many of the world's toughest problems do you think Dartmouth can tackle? Do you think we have to choose? 
or can we come up with a generic culture and approach? And finally, thinking of, for example, problems of energy access as well as healthcare access and how pervasive they are through the developing world. To what extent do you think your experience and your insights with regard to health are generalizable to other areas? Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for that question. Uh, you know, um, in terms of the breadth of what Dartmouth College can take on, I, it's just impossible for me to answer that question right now. I mean, I think there are areas where um, uh, Dartmouth has just really excelled. And of course, we don't want to lose ground in those areas. But, um, you know, one of the things about being a smaller, um, uh, smaller, large institution, which we clearly are, is that I think um, we are going to have to, to pick and choose. Uh, but I, you know, I'm a pretty expansive guy. I've never been known to make things smaller. Uh, and so uh, the question is, how do we make things bigger, meaning more funding, you know, uh, more opportunities? I'm not quite sure. I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, in terms of healthcare, you know, I say this all the time. I, I, when I was at the World Health Organization, the preeminent global health organization, that being a physician helped me quite a lot on many days. Uh, but being an anthropologist helped me every day. So I think that um, what I bring to the situation is not so much an expertise in healthcare in particular, but I've been thinking around healthcare to, I think, a more fundamental uh, problem for me which is, um, you know, how do you get complex groups of people to achieve anything? You've got to have the science. Without the science, you can't go anywhere. You've got to take the next step and do what the Gates Foundation calls development, or the engineering piece of it is going from, uh, as they say at the National Institute of Health, bench to bedside. But then I think, um, uh, and, and, and I think at Dartmouth, uh, we do all those things. We do good discovery, we do good new product development. But I think the one thing that, that um, we do here at Dartmouth that really sets us apart from others is that we also do the delivery part. That, you know, what does it take to actually make these things happen? So um, I hope that what I've learned in trying, to, you know, I spent all my life trying to tackle some really difficult problems, as you've seen. I hope that, um, that, that those experiences will be useful to me in, ta in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, in helping other groups tackle difficult problems. But I don't think we're going to be able to tackle them all here at Dartmouth. I think one of our uh, goals is to create a cadre of leaders who are so well prepared, on fire, to tackle the world's problems that even though they may not have studied in as great a depth that particular problem here, they'll be ready to take it on because of the experience that they have here at Dartmouth. So that, that's definitely the top goal. And then I think we have to talk together about which areas we want to expand and which areas you know, maybe we don't want to expand. I, I, that's really not a presidential decision. It's the, you know, the, that's, I understand clearly that it's the faculty who decide what, what problems you want to tackle and not necessarily the president. Yeah. Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer Durgan. I work for the medical school. Uh, and I was wondering. And I owe you an email, Jennifer. I know. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm getting my question answered. Yeah. Uh, was the presence of a medical school a factor in your decision to come to Dartmouth? And um, if so, you know, were there any elements of the medical school that were particularly uh, attractive? Great. So that was the email that I was supposed to answer. So <laughs> <laughs> this will count as my answer. Um, yeah, you know, I have to say that um, because my experience has been in health so much. I don't know if it would make a lot of sense for me to take over an institution that didn't have a medical school. I mean, and I think, um, and conversely, the institution that causes most college and university presidents the greatest problems are the medical centers, right? <laughs> it's, it's complicated. I mean, I've been in a medical school, and I've, I have a dual appointment in a medical school, a hospital, and then also in the School of Public Health. But I've worked in both worlds for a long time, and I can tell you, it's just arcane and complex, complicated the way these things work together. So I hope I can help in, um, in, in, in working this out. And you know, I hear all the time that, um, you know, uh, you know the, the, the joke that, that, that uh, college presidents tell each other, right? College president dies and goes to heaven, um, which I think is the preferred course uh, for college presidents. And it's their campus. And they say, wow, this is great. I didn't know that I'd get to live on the campus for or the rest of my days. And he said, just out of curiosity, what does hell look like? Right? 
And they say, okay, I'll show you. And they go, and it's the same thing. It's the campus. And they say, well, what's the difference? Ah, this one has an academic medical center. <laughs> <laughs> I just tell you this because I hear this all the time, right? People say, hey, have you heard the president, college president joke? Uh, so I, 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 I think, I, first of all, I completely believe that academic medical centers can have a huge impact on undergraduate education. I've, I've seen it, I've done it, I, I believe that fully. But I also believe that, that academic medical centers are fantastic institutions. Are, they, you know, in my view, academic medical centers in the world of healthcare are the jewels in the crown of the US. They don't exist in every country. They don't even exist in every uh, a developed country. So I think they're tremendous assets. And so, yes, I, I mean, I think, I think if, there, if there were another institution that asked me to do this job and there wasn't an academic, I don't know that I would take it. Yeah. Paul. Uh, more important, would you have taken the job if you didn't have a break in business? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so uh, I, you know, um, I've begun teaching undergraduates and, and I've been teaching undergraduates and I've told people that teaching undergraduates was the greatest um, educational experience in my life. I just really enjoyed it. I'm not saying that medical students and school public health students are um, without hope, uh, but they come to us much more formed. And so teaching undergraduates is a very special experience for me. And so I said that. But then you heard what I've said. The three schools that I've been working with were the medical school, the business school, and an engineering school uh, at MIT. So it was the perfect constellation of professional schools in addition uh, to a fantastic um, uh, undergraduate college institution. So it all, and, and again, I think if it weren't, if it, 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 other institutions would not have made as much sense for me personally uh, in terms of taking on a role as a, as a college president. Yeah, yes sir. Uh, Professor Roger Masters from the government department. Yes, I've just spent a weekend with one of the world's leaders in agricultural economics in feeding the world yes the same problems that right. you've described. I think your descriptions are right on target from what he said, but it does indicate something else. He told me that one of the leading causes of disease is malnutrition. Absolutely. And I just wonder how you see the interaction between getting health care into local communities throughout the world, especially in poor areas in Africa, and better food. Right. So um, let me start by telling you a story. So in the Russian prison system, we were in the midst of a huge argument. The, the, the people in the TB world, who I told you try to kick us out of Peru and were against treating drug-resistant TB, uh, we were arguing with them about what, um, uh, what we should do in the prison system. And we looked at the calorie counts in the prison system. And because they were suffering from tuberculosis, which is a consumptive disease, that for people who don't remember or who don't, have never heard this, that's what it used to be called, consumption. Uh, and then also not feed them is crazy. You've got to feed them. You know, they've got to have enough protein content, for example, to be able to you know, mount an immune response, for example. So we, we sat and we argued with these people, and we said, you've got to give them food. And this was an arguing about a World Bank uh, uh, loan. And they, the, the, the doctor said, there's no evidence that food has any role in TB treatment. And we said, what? <laughs> Well, there's some evidence that uh, micronutrient, uh, um, uh, micronutrient, uh, micronutrients might have a role, meaning vitamins, but there's no evidence that food. So in other words, and you know, this is what the quality improvement people say. Well, there's no evidence that spitting in a surgical wound is going to be bad for the patient, but don't spit in the wound, right? Sorry, that's a, that's a quality improvement joke, right, Mike? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's just some things that are so obvious that you don't have studies for them. But we had this argument. We call it in Partners in Health lore, we call it the food fight, right? So the understanding among healthcare professionals that hunger is, is, a, is, a, is a disease for which we have a cure, food, right? That's been difficult. It's been hard to link uh, nutritional efforts with healthcare efforts in a lot of developing countries. And I think it's really important because what happens is that you get a whole um, infrastructure and industry of people who work on food. They have their own offices, their own NGOs, their own four-wheel drive vehicles, and they make a living off of this. And we do things like insist in the United States that all food has to be American food, and that by the time it gets to the African countries, 
some 90% of the cost is transport. And then what happens often is that it destroys the local economy and farmers go out of business. So all these things happen and, and, and we're not doing it in a way that's integrated, that's rational, that's focused on creating value and outcomes at the end of the day. So I think all that stuff has to happen. And I think, again, academic institutions have a critical role to play, and a wide variety of disciplines have to be involved. Right. Uh, Next. I actually have a question yeah. from the sure. overflow room here. Sure. Um, this is from Aaron Cochran, who's the director of Major Gifts. She's a Tuck alumna and also, obviously, a Tuck employee. So her question is, for those of us who work for Dartmouth, who want to offer our ideas and support to you as you transition into the presidency, what is the best way to contact you or participate? And she also adds, as an alumna employee, she's inspired. Thank you. Um, Barry? <laughs> yeah. So for right now, for right, right, for right now, I have uh, a Dartmouth account, uh, either jim.young.kim at Dartmouth or jim.y.kim. And um, I, I, it's going to be difficult for me to, to respond right away, but please be in contact. And I'll be here starting July 1st, and I hope to be around a lot and, uh, and, and to talk with, with, with people a lot. But for now, um, Barry and uh, Barry Sher, our provost, and if you can't see him here, and, uh, and Laura Hercod are uh, uh, helping me manage uh, the transition period. But I very much look forward to, to talking with, uh, with everybody. Dr. Kim, my name's Tom Luxon. I'm a professor of English and uh, director of the Dartmouth Center for the Advancement of Learning. And I also am very encouraged uh, and you. very excited by what you've said. I wanted to focus on, on uh, one theme here, which is you've started right off with what was, what's often missing is the execution. Bringing the theory and the disciplinary work and the research and pushing all the way to execution. Um, uh, I went to the University of Chicago. They don't do music, they study music, they don't do theater. They, it's the life of the mind, not the life of the execution, although that's changing there, and with good reason. Um, uh, I'm, this is a question you're probably not going to want to answer today, but eventually, maybe in the, at the end of the first year. What are the executions that, that, that Dartmouth needs? What are the executables, I guess, for the deliverables for Dartmouth in the near and mid-future? Um, is it more, more research, more education, more uh, innovation in teaching? You know that's where I'm interested. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, but what are your, what's your idea of what we need well, to execute? So I think that's my job for the next year, is to, f is to figure out what that's going to be for us as a community. You know, um, uh, it's, it's um, in one of the, the things that we've learned from all those things that we talked about. So um, if you look at the drug-resistant TB initiative, when things changed was when the World Health Organization, who was our, you know, uh, working actively against us at first, when things changed is when they changed. So one of the things that, that, that um, we've come to understand is that while at first you need to get out and sort of think boldly, think big, don't listen too much to the naysayers, eventually you have to really understand why the naysayers are saying what they're saying and then bring them on board. So, I, I don't know what, what it is. I don't think that, I think, I, you know, I've watched a certain institution just south of here um, where if you don't listen enough to, you know, to what your people are, are saying to you, that there can be bad outcomes, right? So I've watched this. And I think that I'm going to have to spend a lot of time listening to all of you to figure out what that is going to be. And I just, I don't know. And I, what I found, um, the one, one, I guess the best thing I learned from being in institutions like Harvard and the World Health Organization and down in Peru and Haiti is that um, institutions make themselves known to you if you pay attention. So I have learned, I think, a bit of patience in getting inside and figuring out how something works. Right? So I've been talking with Paul. I've been talking with a lot of people about what's it going to be like going inside the Obama administration. I said, you know, you have to just have faith that, that you don't know what's going on now. I mean, when people tell me, well, WHO should just do this and this and this, and I see, oh my God, they have no idea how that place works. But I didn't either until I was right in the thick of it. So I make no assumptions about how Dartmouth College works. 
and with great humility we'll go forward trying to figure out how it works and then see if we can come together around some really inspiring goals. I, I'm, not, I'm not good if we're just keeping things steady. I, I, I'm no good at that. I'm, I, I, I have to be excited and inspired myself. So I'm sure we're going to find a lot of things to take on. And um, I just don't know what they are yet. OK? Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, my name is Matt Ippolito. Um, as a Dartmouth undergraduate, I was a um, a class of 1960 scholar, so I interacted with uh, with the class of 1960 a lot, and so I, I think that your description of like how heartfelt people's connections to the institution are is very accurate. Um, and I'm currently a medical student, and um, I know that uh, I speak for my colleagues as well when I say that uh, my colleagues here at Dartmouth Medical School, as well as medical schools around the country, that were very excited um, about your upcoming tenure. Um, so thank you, thank you for speaking with us, uh, especially about this topic. Um, I, I have a, a pretty specific question. I, I was somewhat involved with universities allied for essential medicines, and I'm wondering if you support the adoption by the Dartmouth Technical Transfer Office of a provision that would preclude licensees of its technology from preventing uh, third world governments from uh, uh, manufacturing generic drugs. Uh, so, so, you know, it's called UAEM, and they're so annoying. They come and they ask these annoying questions all the time to, in public settings. Uh, you, know, you know very well that I've supported uh, the, the um, Universities of Life for Essential Medicines from the beginning. I think that uh, you know, the, the, um, uh, the basic idea is that without any loss of, of money from royalties, you can actually ensure that something that's discovered at your institution will be made available in developing countries. And a lot of uh, institutions have done that. And I, and I strongly support that. I don't know what the situation here is at Dartmouth, frankly. But um, I've uh, been on record for years as supporting it. And um, uh, I, think, I think that what you guys have done is just great. I think that the whole group of students who have worked on this, I, I've also seen it evolve over time. At first, it was very confrontational. And, and, and uh, uh, students did this sort of thing all the time, putting people on the spot. Uh, but I, but I, think, I think that it's evolved, and I think we found ways of both um, encouraging innovation, encouraging uh, universities to invest in this in, 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 uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the way that they have, in, in finding new tools, but then also finding ways to make it fair so that everyone has access. So as a, as a, as a concept and as a movement, I believe in it fully. I just don't know quite how we're going to make that work here at Dartmouth. Yeah. Sorry, I'm sitting right in front of the camera and I don't want to. Um, my name is Chantal Sloan. I'm a fifth year in the genetics department, but I've also done a lot of uh, cross training in public health and geography and some other things. And I found that the resources we have here at Dartmouth are great in a lot of respects, but a lot of times, especially in public health, they're difficult to find because they're in these little secluded yeah. pockets over at the hospital right. and the MPH program, but they're great if you know how to find them. Um, and I was wondering what you felt the role of interdisciplinary training was in tackling some of our biggest problems as an educational institution, and if you had any ideas yet about um, how you were going to increase opportunities in interdisciplinary training. Yeah. Well, I, you know, as you could tell, I'm, a, I'm a, a believer in interdisciplinary training, and it's not so much... Um, I think that if people come together around tackling a really difficult but... Um, uh, exciting, important problem that it, you don't, it, it, there's, there, there can be a very wooden feel sometimes to interdisciplinary efforts where, you know, the, you know, one department will have meetings with another department, they'll start talking, it, it can be very wooden. Whereas I've seen it in other settings where if it's about a particular problem that people are excited about, people come together and clearly bring their disciplinary training with them. You need that. But um, the boundaries sort of evaporate very quickly. So um, I, you know, I, I think that, that that's the question, is, is that you know, can we take on some of these major problems together and then be very inviting in terms of people from all the other disciplines? That's when I've seen it work best, let's put it that way. I, I, I think that when you uh, kind of artificially encourage things to happen, it doesn't work very well. So. Yeah. Hi. Dr. Kim. My name is Lisa Treat. I, I'm also a recent Cambridge transplant. I'm a postdoc for Brian Pogue and Joyce DeLeo. Um, I'm putting together a freshman don't, seminar. Don't tell the people at Harvard what I said, okay? <laughs> <laughs> 
It's okay. Uh, it's going to be on YouTube, to so it's fine. working with you. I'm putting yeah. together a freshman seminar for next spring on, uh -huh. on biotechnology needs for global health. Um, but I was wondering, as you take on your new role as president of Dartmouth College, um, how do you envision your continued collaboration with Partners in Health and um, the Brigham Women's Hospital uh, yeah. Social Medicine? Yeah. It's a great question. You know, the thing is, I've been with Partners in Health for so long, and I was with Partners in Health when I was at WHO. So my connection to Partners in Health will never end. I mean, it's just, it's part of my DNA now. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a great question, and we're still working on that. How can we uh, make Partners in Health uh, part of Dartmouth and, and, and vice versa? Um, I'd, I'd love to do that. I don't know quite how yet but it's something that I'm committed to doing. And you know, there, the great news is that there are a lot of um, uh, Dartmouth grads who are also really involved with Partners in Health. The, president, the head of the President's Leadership Council, for example, Bill Hellman, is a great supporter of uh, both Partners in Health and Dartmouth. So I think there are lots of ways that we can do it. I certainly bring the spirit of Partners in Health here with me. Um, I don't, and, I, and again, I don't know how NGOs like Partners in Health would make a relationship with Dartmouth. My understanding is that there have been some great relationships between NGOs and Dartmouth in the past, and we've just got to look at that. Right? We have time for two more questions. Um, Sincere thanks for your talk, uh, uh, President Kim. My name is Manish. I am a TACO 9. And um, I was curious, as you look at the global health uh, landscape, what are one or two specific areas uh, on which, um, if one might focus, that can generate the most impact? Yeah. Um, I, I, think that, I think the most important next step in global health is to stop thinking about it in isolation with problems like nutrition. I think that the, 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 these problems are linked to poverty in a very deep way, uh, but also they're linked together. And um, I, I think that as a, as a Tuck graduate, thinking hard about the kinds of systems you want to build so that you tackle nutritional health, employment, uh, infrastructure problems at the same time, uh, without all the heavy overhead, without, having, w without paying huge amounts of overhead to every single organization that takes a small slice of a problem, I think that's really going to be the major issue. Uh, I, I think that with the money that we're putting right now into foreign assistance, we can absolutely transform not only the healthcare but the economies of, uh, of many developing countries. And I think that's a really important way for us to show the compassion of the American people. Right. And uh, I, I, so I think in that particular field, for people who are in engineering and business world, getting us to a point where we're thinking system-wide, where we're looking at how all of these different uh, slivered stovepipe programs can be brought together, I think that's going to have a huge impact. And it's gonna, I, th I think it's the greatest thing we can do in terms of our uh, relationship to other countries. And that's, that's precisely what this government is talking about. And I have to say, let me say, that I think President Bush's PEPFAR initiative was one of the greatest gestures ever. And it also helped to focus um, global development efforts in a much more practical way. So I, I, I don't, I, I'm, I've got great hopes for this administration, but I think we should also be sure to give appropriate recognition for what, uh, what President Bush did. I think that's the, that's the, that, it, that issue is so much more important than anything else. Uh, that, that I'll, I'll give you the one answer, sorry. Hi, um, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Sean Balakurthy, 09, and I'm also from Iowa. So in addition to everything everyone said about why they're so excited you're here, that's uh, one reason why I am. Um, but, but no, honestly, you, you can tell we're from Iowa, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my dad has pulled me over to the side of the road and said the exact same thing. <laughs> I can study whatever I want after residency. Um, so my question relates to Professor Luxon's about execution. It's obviously something that is incredibly important in solving any problem, even like including global health problems. And I was wondering, as an undergraduate student, how do you propose to teach skills related to execution? How do you propose to teach students or encourage sort of a, like a, a better understanding of how to execute? Yeah. Uh, it's a great question, and, and you know, frankly, I think it's one of the central questions 
for higher education. Um, you know, uh, I've been hiring a lot of really brilliant young people to work with us in tough settings on building healthcare programs. And these are people who, you know, um, Andover and Dartmouth and Harvard Medical School, I mean, just the best educational experiences. And I've come to saying, you know, I think we should stop looking at their college and medical school transcripts and we should look at their second grade transcript and see how they did on works and plays well with others. <laughs> a lot of them get U's on that, right? <laughs> so that's, that's part of execution, right? That's part of execution, understanding how to work in social groups, understanding how to get along with other people, understanding how to lead, how to follow. These are really important parts of execution because it's all about human organizations trying to accomplish things. So um, I think that's part of it. I think teaching, um, you know, Carol has been working on a leadership curriculum. I, I think you can teach it. I think there's parts of leadership that you can teach. I think you get a lot of it here at Dartmouth. I mean, I, 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 you know, half of you are in fraternities and sororities. You voted with your feet. I think there's something very special that must be happening there, in addition to Bong, uh, that Pong, excuse me. <laughs> you know, there's something very special happening there that you're learning that I don't think everyone gets. You know, um, so how do you teach it? Well, this is this is I think my central um, central problem for the next decade or so. Can can we do that? Can we teach people not only to be really deep in their discipline, to dive deep? Can we teach people how to um, do molecular genetics research in a way that no one could ever have imagined? Well, even even if what you're doing is molecular genetics research, I think the most productive place in the country right now where they're doing molecular genetics research is the Broad Institute. And I think the reason that works so well is because the guy who runs it, Eric Lander, is a friend of mine, he taught for nine years at Harvard Business School, and it runs amazingly well in terms of it being a social institution where people work together. So in other words, he brought his other sense of how to organize things in addition to just the science. So I think that no matter what you take on, if you do molecular genetics research, you have to run your lab. So you have to know something about execution. Let me just say again, I think it's done better here at Dartmouth uh, than any other place I've seen. But um, I, I, think, I think we can even take it to the next level and demonstrate for the other institutions throughout the United States and the world that you actually can teach people uh, about this in a lot of different ways. Any more from the overflow? If, if there, there is one, I think. Um, okay, one, and then we'll have one last one here. So this is from Susan Warner in um, Communications and Computing Services. Her question is, how do you see integrating professional graduate schools with the undergraduate mission of the college? Yeah. Well, I, you know, again, I think, I think um, certainly uh, Joe Helbley and, and the Thayer School is incredibly well integrated with undergraduate education. I see initiatives at the Tuck School. I mean, it's one of the major things that, that, that um, um, Dean Danos and the Tuck School are doing. Uh, to try to bring business education in, more into the uh, undergraduate education. And, you know, the students are very involved, as far as I understand, in, um, in the medical school. Um, you know, one, one hope is that just because of who I am and what I've done, uh, that I can help to take that to the, to the next level, whatever that might be, and to encourage it even further. Uh, I just, I, I, I'm a firm believer that the professional schools enhance undergraduate education, and we just have to figure out how to do it even better. Question, guys. So my name is Hee Jung, and I'm a first year medical student here. And I was just wondering, as a student right now, what we could be doing to be prepared to be tackling the world's problems in the near future? So at the risk of sounding like my father, um, <laughs> First year medical students should be focusing on learning anatomy and, can, you know, I, I think that um, it's really important to have a sense of, of, uh, of time. So um, when you're a first year medical student, mastering the details of your anatomy and physiology is, is important. And you're going to be surprised at when that comes back to you. Right? So when it came back to me most um, vividly is when I was in Haiti, or Peru, or anywhere. I mean, it's happened to me a lot, and you're the only doctor around, right? Those patients are gonna benefit a lot if you've studied hard in your first year. <laughs> Seriously, right? 
So I think you have to understand how things work timing-wise. As a first-year medical student, I think, you know, focus on, on your studies. Do really, really well. Because, you know, being good at executing around that task, which is you know, understanding basic science, is really important for you going forward. You'll be surprised at how important it is for you. And the, the, the more um, socially relevant your work is, in many ways, the more important that is, because you're not going to be around in a hospital setting where everyone can help you. Um, and then, I, I, you know, there's a lot of different paths to take. I think there's a great MD, MBA program here for people. I think uh, doing an MPH with uh, Dartmouth Institute is a great way to go in, in terms of learning about these things. Um, I think going into engineering is great. If you, you know, I, I, if you can do the math, I think, you know, systems engineering is, it, I think systems engineering is going to revolutionize healthcare delivery, right? In addition to the business professions, I think those are the professions that are going to really uh, uh, revolutionize how we do um, uh, healthcare. So, taking on other things to study, I, I, you know, I, you, you, everyone has their own limitations in life, but um, I think taking on another field of study is great. You know, and in terms of our medical education as well, um, can we integrate those kinds of uh, topics more into medical education? There's a big movement right now at Harvard Medical School because in front of the Harvard Medical School Board of Fellows, which is uh, the group that, the, big, the major donors, uh, the head of the local, uh, the head of the Massachusetts Blue Cross Blue Shield asked the fourth year medical students, this was last year, how much did you learn about healthcare delivery? And to a one, they said nothing, right? And that was the year just prior to when we started teaching them about healthcare delivery. So we do now, but not much. And so the, uh, the, the, the Board of Fellows said, what's going on here? How can you not teach them about healthcare delivery when they're going to be the most important players in the healthcare systems? that are either going to bring down the U.S. government and break the bank or transform itself into the most effective, efficient, high-quality system the world's ever seen. So um, I think we can build it into medical education, but I also think it's great if you have time and if you have the, the energy to take on some of these other fields. Uh, with that, um, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Kim for taking time out of his busy yeah. schedule to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.